We're going to be reviewing the chapter 4 frappy that you had. Now, if you read the question, uh, it says to give yourself about 15 minutes, so hopefully you timed yourself, made sure you're in the 15-minute ballpark. If it was a little less, that's awesome. A little bit more, that's not awful, but if you found yourself spending like 20 minutes on it, then you want to probably think about how much detail you put in. What I did was I went through this myself, I answered the questions, I'm going to share with you my answers and my approach to answering this, and hopefully it'll help you on future questions like this. So in this case, uh, you have 166 adults from the St. Louis area, and they were recruited and randomly assigned to receive one of two treatments for a sinus infection. Half received an antibiotic, and the other half received a placebo. And we had to answer some questions about that. The first one was, describe how the researchers could have assigned treatments to subjects if they wanted to use a completely randomized design. Now remember, with a completely randomized design, you take all of your subjects, and then you randomly assign them a treatment, or in this case, you assign them a treatment and a placebo. And what you're hoping is that in the course of doing that, since you're using random assignment, you get... The confounding variables all kind of end up on both sides, and any effects that they would have on your results would cancel each other out. That's kind of an idealistic way of looking at it. Now, here's how I designed mine. I'll share with you the details. I would assign a subject. I would assign each subject a number from one to 166. I would select 83 non-repeating random integers, and I'm even going to put a detail in here. How would I do that? I forgot that. I'm going to, using a random number generator. Notice how I include that detail. It's something I missed the first time. Always include that. Um, how are you randomly doing it? That's an important detail, and I did here. So we're using a random number generator. I would select 83 non-repeating random integers, and I would assign the treatment to the individuals with the corresponding numbers. The remaining subjects would receive the placebo. So what I did by doing that is randomly I selected the individuals who get the treatment and then the others were obviously randomly selected too because if I randomly selected some to get treatment, the rest are going to get the placebo. So what I explained my process, I explained how I was going to randomly generate these numbers and how I would go about doing it. Make sure you're including details like that. You notice I mentioned that how I assign the subjects the number. Always say that first, that you're going to assign a number. And then, you know, using the random number generator, you know, select 83. I could have said, you know, I could select 83 non-repeating random integers and assign those the placebo and then to give the rest of them the treatment. That doesn't really matter. You just want to make sure there's some random assignment going on. Right, the second part said all the subjects in the experiment had moderate, severe, or very severe symptoms at the beginning of the study. Describe one statistical benefit for using subjects with moderate, severe, or very severe and did say one drawback or oh, benefit and one drawback. So I covered both here. I gave a couple sentences for each of them. I think I might have gone with three sentences. You really don't want to go too crazy. You want to provide enough detail, but you don't want to provide too much either. So I said that one statistical benefit is you have an opportunity to see how well the treatment works on varying degrees of infection. If you only had moderate degrees of infection, the treatment in the placebo placebo might appear to have little difference, whereas you'll probably notice a bigger difference if the infection is severe or very severe. And also, if you only tested people with minor infections, the results you get would make you think there's little difference between the medication and the placebo, and you miss out on using a medication that could heal people quicker and more effectively. Notice how I include that last sentence here. What would be a result of me not doing this correctly? Like, if I, if I didn't account for these differences, what could happen to my results? Always include something like that. You don't want to just say, well, this could happen. You know, like, it would be bad. Why would it be bad? You'll notice here that I said, because you would misjudge the effectiveness of the medication. If you only had moderate, then you'd say, well, you know, maybe it doesn't work. I'm not really seeing a huge difference. Whereas maybe this, could, this medication could be a huge benefit to people with severe symptoms. I mentioned the drawback is that it's possible using randomized design that you end up getting a lot of people, like I said, um with uh, one degree or another, you, it gets becomes disproportionate. So I said, for example, if the treatment group ends up with primarily very severe infections and the placebo group ends up with primarily moderate infections, maybe you would think that the placebo and the treatment work equally well when in actuality effectiveness only appeared that way because you didn't have any severe cases taking the placebo. 
So that's something you want to be aware of too. With randomized design, completely randomized design, it is possible that you could end up with disproportionate people getting the treatment on either end, you know? Especially in this case where you have um, specific, you know, degrees of infection. That can make a big difference. So those are the things I noted here. Be careful. You want to make sure you note those details and always note some sort of consequence. That's always really, really good when you're doing some sort of uh, experiment here. You're explaining experimental design. Always explain a consequence of what might happen if you did something badly or wrong. All right. And then for part D, it's all oh, part C, excuse me. At different stages during the next month, they all took the cyanasal test. After 10 days, the difference in average scores was not statistically significant. In this context, explain what it means to not be statistically significant. I'll share with you my answer. I said it means that when they compared the distance and average scores, or I should have said difference, excuse me. So I'm going to change that. It's all right. That's why we're going through this. Distance, I guess, wouldn't be the worst thing, but I'm going to go with difference. So when you compared the difference in average scores on the sanal nasal test for those who received treatment those versus those who received the placebo... It probably means the difference was close to zero or had very low absolute value. Maybe you noticed there was a difference of one on either end, which isn't super significant. If there was a difference between one and the other, you'd expect to see a difference that would be greater than or less to zero without being really close to it. So as an example, right? Like say you had a dot plot and you're plotting your differences, right? You have zero. And again, like this isn't a matched pairs design, but if it was, right, like if you were measuring, you know, people with uh, differences, right, if it was matched pairs, you'd expect to see a lot of differences right here near zero. If you saw some way out, if you saw most of your values way out there, you'd be more inclined to think that one's working better than the other, because if, they, if it didn't work better than the other... You'd see a lot, you wouldn't see much of a difference when you took one square versus the other and subtracted it. You'd probably be, you'd probably be getting zero or really close to it if there wasn't a difference. So that's what was very specific to note here. So if there was a difference between one and the other, you expect to see a difference greater than or less than zero without being really close to zero. Because I mean, if you're talking like decimal places, then you know it's probably not that big of a difference. But if you're noticing something significantly far from zero. I hate to use the word significant, but I think you know what I mean. That's when I'd be probably more inclined to think that one's working better than the other. And the last question here, and you probably noticed I did a little block design down below. One possible way the researchers could have improved the study is to use a randomized block design. Explain how researchers could have incorporated blocking into their design. So I did a brief explanation, and I did an illustration to help you guys. So I said researchers could have blocked by the severity of symptoms, creating three groups, moderate, severe, and very severe. Then within each group, randomly assign half of each with those symptoms to the treatment and the other half with those symptoms, the placebo. I drew it out down here. So I started out with 166 and I split them up based on their symptoms, moderate, severe, and very severe. Then within those groups, I took, like, I took the moderates, right? I randomly assigned half of them the antibiotic, half of them the placebo, and I compared their results. I did the same thing with the severe symptoms. Randomly assigned half of them an antibiotic, half of them a placebo, compared the results. And I did the exact same thing with the very severe. What that allows me to do is by comparing within these, maybe for those with moderate, I didn't notice much of a difference. But when it got to severe and very severe, I noticed a big difference. So at the end, that's why I compare those three results. I can come out of this saying, well, if you only have moderate sinus symptoms, maybe the antibiotic isn't a big, you know, maybe it's not going to help you improve that much versus a placebo. However, if you have severe, very severe symptoms, you're probably better off taking the antibiotic. I could come to that conclusion now because I accounted for that confounding variable when I blocked here. So hopefully this gives you some perspective on how to answer this question. It's the first free response question you've really seen, and you're going to be seeing these throughout the year. So hopefully you paid attention to the depth I provided, how long each one was, as well as the key things like providing consequences for a result, being specific when I was doing my random assignment, not overly specific, but just enough so that you can give it an idea that you know what's going on with this process. Of course, if you have any questions, you know you can